Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, we need to realize what is happening in Central and South America that is pernicious and that we need to stop and why we cannot do it any other way. Now, firstly, what is going on nowadays there, it's the so-called pink tide, where you have those uh, left-wing governments that are nationalizing all major, um, all major economic assets of those countries and controlling them in allegiance with politi uh, the political elite, in allegiance with business elite, and nothing of that coming to the people. We believe this is a huge problem, and we believe that we need to solve it any means possible. How do we want to solve it? Now, they want us to skew the elections and things like that. And we do realize that this is something quite undemocratic, and that this is something quite radical for the US, let's say. <laughs> and what do we want to tell you from the first government? We will corrupt people to skew these, uh, skew these votes. We will set up on the election boards uh, skewed numbers and things like that, use the CIA, use anything that we have that is possible in our means to skew those votes for the opposition to win. Now, why do we believe, no thank you, and we will do it secretly, of course. Now, why do we believe that the US should do this? First of all, we believe that the US should do this for its own geopolitical reasons, that it is connected historically and with the markets with these countries and should help them to develop. On the other hand, not just develop as develop, but we believe that with development, there comes the political stability and the bigger empowerment of people who live there that will be good and in the US interest to be uh, in the, the close, um, close uh, borders with these countries. We believe that this will bring bigger stability in the region, bigger prosperity in the region that will create a more powerful continent. No, thank you. Now, on the other hand, the US believes in the power of the freedom of the market. And now a lot of people who know about the Decada Perdida with Milton Friedman in the South America will laugh. But we believe that we need to restart this process because we believe in the freedom of markets done properly. Now, what do I mean by that? No, thank you. This is the answer of why it is legitimate to do this. Now, the freedom of, mar the freedom of market is something that liberates people. Now, on what means? It gives the individual a possibility to make its own choices on where to work, on what to educate for, and to create different markets. We, do, we are aware of the fact that this is not an easy task for a country that has a lot of poor people, but at least it uh, liberates them from the political government that is deciding everything for them. Now, we come to the second part of this argument. It liberates nations from government control. Now, we do realize that in the Western world, capitalism is doing maybe some atrocities within the class, uh, classes of how they earn and things like that. But you have to realize that in these countries, the government is everything. People don't really have any sort of choice what will they do on the market, how will their government earn any sort of money. And even worse than that, with all the money coming to, coming to the government hands, it's not redis redistributed towards the citizens. Why is this important? Because these governments are fiercely corrupted. These governments are fiercely, uh, fiercely authoritarian and they don't see it fit to distribute it anything to their people because their political leaders are mostly political fathers of their countries. But before I continue, yes, Shira. Can we try this before? <laughs> yeah. And as I said, we were talking about the Cada Perdida and I'm coming to that point right now. Why is this better than any other alternative? Why should we skew votes and not like have political talks, use diplomacy, use money, carrots and sticks and stuff like that? Well, the reason is because of the Decada Perdida. What does this mean? Uh, through the Cold War, these people went through this huge a uh, huge uh, propaganda of the freedom of market and how it will save everything. And that went wrong, to say the least. And Milton Friedman went there with his shock effect on a poor nation, on a nation that had no uh, developed economy, no developed hierarchy in society that was functional for a lot of people, that had no political culture that was supportive of this sort of ideology as free market is, and it went terribly. And these people have a 
huge memory of this period and they are scared of it. With any mention of the US, of the capitalism, of the freedom of markets, they are scared of it because they're afraid they will go to the Cada Perdida. On the other hand, you have to realize that these people, their leaders, left-wing governments, uh, are populistic, are, are using propaganda and fears of these people to convince them that the US and the Western world only wants to conquer them and take everything they have because they have a huge memory of the Cold War and a lot of them still identify as being on the other side of the US in that sort of war. So basically we don't have any means to convince them and these populistic corrupted governments have a lot of power uh, by uh, feeding on the fear of their people to sell them their ideas and stay on the, on the power even though they're corrupting their people. No, thank you. No. We do realize that in these countries you have a huge gap. You have small amount of really, really rich people and you have a lot of poor people. So do you have in the US recently. Why is this different? Because they will come and tell you that capitalism cannot solve poverty gaps because we nowadays have examples of the US having the same problem with the movement of 99% towards one. But we tell you that this is a different situation. How come? In the US, you have a functioning government. You have a functioning democracy that is giving you the opportunity to change something at least. Here, you have a problem that this government is destroying the opposition. How? They're not allowing them the same media coverage. They are not allowing them to concentrate their power. In some countries, they're putting them in prison. For example, like Pinochet did and uh, people like him. So basically, the opposition needs a clean start. They need a leverage and a platform to spread their ideas. This is all we want because we believe that the opposition can bring the real change to these countries, not just considering the way the country redistributes the money they have, but considering giving the chance to some other people to step up here, because people who are now the political elite and the powerful elite are the, are the people that have been here for years and years and years and years. We believe in a shift of power and some changes that are not dramatic, but that are enough to make a different perception. Thank you. Good morning, comrades. This is an old recipe from the CIA playbook that has failed. <laughs> The first time that we gave the people the right to vote after the CIA involved some, got involved somewhere was when Pinochet had the stupid idea of having a referendum and lost it. Because people are basically sick and tired of the story of free markets and trickle-down economics and all the other crap you're going to hear from the government bench. I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk first of all about how these nations are so sovereign and how we can't violate the free will of the citizens. Second, I'm going to discuss US values and how this contradicts them, especially in the times of Comrade Obama. And finally, I'm going to talk about how the left wing is the best alternative for them and how Bolivarian socialism is actually the best way forward <laughs> for these countries. Now, before that, a bit of a battle. So, first of all, like obviously, as Marco points out, all the stability and like, prosperity and political systems, whatever stuff that we hear from opening government, simply aren't empirically true. Right? The CIA has tried this before in pretty much every Latin American country that could get to. They also tried to do it secretly, but eventually, like, even if you bribe people, like the Latin Americans, they talk too much. Right? So eventually, these things come out, but even if they don't, what we have seen is that all these countries all the instability that you can find in all these countries can find their roots back to corrupt systems and corrupt elites installed by the United States of America and other foreign powers when they were trying to manipulate the outcomes of elections and political processes in these countries. Why? Because simply they did not have the consent of the people, as we're going to talk about later in our case. The freedom of market and the freedom to work and the freedom to do whatever is simply not important if you don't have the freedom to choose your own political outcomes. We can see the scenario that uh, much like a lot of places in Europe, much like the United States of America, we're going to have people vote, want to vote against these free market policies very soon. We see that the left is on the rise in a lot of places, and we see that the left is on, a, on the rise in Latin America, obviously, where it has won scores of free and fair elections. 
Would the government then have to intervene again because people don't like these free markets and don't like the fact that they don't lead to anything? We beg to differ. On that point. This idea of the distribution and like the distribution is wonderful and so on and so forth. First of all, manipulating elections, as I said, demands like bribing officials, replacing officials, right? That breeds corruption, right? So first of all, we're talking about a system that's going to be corrupt from the start. Second, free markets have a fantastic tendency of redistributing funds and capital and resources from the poorer countries to the rich countries, oh, as was the case in most Latin American countries, I was the, as the case in Latin America ever since colonialism up until today, when Western companies went in and took resources for themselves. So, they say that like left-wing governments tend to be more authoritarian, right? That's a false claim unless you back it up. What we know, however, is that governments basically are more authoritarian and tend to be more afraid if they know that they do not have the consent of the people. Uh -huh. We point to the example, for instance, of Slobodan Milosevic and look at the authoritarian patterns, right? Yeah. And what happened like the moment that he knew that he had to manipulate elections just to stay in power until he got overthrown by the people. They say that the left wing is inherently populist. We point to the Tea Party in the United States of America, which is the most populist thing alive, and it also like harbors a large part of the libertarian movement that the open government is espousing. Moreover, we think that right wing uh, right-wing right politics worldwide play on religion and values which are inherently more populist than the claim that people should have more power and people deserve more rights. Um, they claim that the U.S. is a functioning democracy. We're going to refer to the franchise of the black people that can't vote because simply they like the Democrats more. We point to Florida, where Washington manipulated elections, the closest thing they could find to Latin America because of the sun sit down. We also um, think that it's impossible in the United States of America to start a party that doesn't fall in the framework of the Democrats and the Republicans, simply because there's no framework for you to get media attention, as you do in Europe, that doesn't involve itself that much in Latin America and other places. Finally, this idea of the, no, thank you, the opposition not having a platform. Uh, Bol Bolivia, Venezuela, we think they had a platform, they lost the elections that they had a platform for, there was a referendum for a constitution that was also fair. If you have a question about like whether or not the opposition has a platform, you send it monitors, you don't send CIA agents with bags of cash. Also in Chile, where Pinochet was the only guy that had a platform, people voted against the free market reforms that he had. Before we move on, yeah. What's the richest country of South America? I don't care, because frankly, the point is that if you're going to advocate that it's Chile, then you'd have to somehow justify in your extension how thousands of people went missing or died, why the Chilean people voted against it, how rich the Chilean person is in comparison to anyone else on the American continent, and so on and so forth. We don't buy this as a game of numbers, right? So first, sovereign nations, right? These countries are sovereign, the people have a free will. As I said, if you want to check whether or not they have fair and fair elections, you can monitor it through the United Nations or some other like mechanism like that. But at the end of the day, we think that if you start violating the sovereignty of nations again, all you're achieving is turning the world back to the Cold War, where small nations who are incapable of having their own will, of having their own way, right? All that happened was bigger and richer powers manipulating them and doing whatever they wanted, right? In terms of now comparing that to America, right? So first of all, we think that it's against American values to go in and basically viol like violate democracy, right? I, we, we know, right, sit down, we know that this is against their practices in a lot of ways, but we think that that doesn't make it right. Yeah, we think that what America should be doing is finally put its money where its mouth is and stop intervening in other places and do work towards democracy and freedom, right? Now, why is this relevant to Obama in any way, right? So Obama has started talking, for instance, to Cuba, recognizing that a country can follow a different political or economic system and still be a partner to the United States in some sort of way. This has led to reforms in Cuba that are generally positive, right? And are generally in line with what the United States of America wants. We think that if the United States of America accepted these countries, it would be far better. But also, and this is going to trickle on the next page, why, why is the left wing best, right, in this case? So first of all, as I've said in the rebuttal, these resources, like, what, what happened before was resources were taken away by multinational corporations to other countries. Nationalizing resources in these countries were important to create the base for a welfare state so that everyone has a minimum income that they can participate in society without fear of how they're going to survive the next day. There was no other way for these resources to reach the poor given they were being exported away. Moreover, however, we see that these left-wing governments, Bolivia, Venezuela, and so on and so forth, have, have come together to form the Bolivarian Alternative, which has the potential to become a very strong trading bloc and also it's the first time that Latin Americans by themselves have empowered, have empowered them to the point to be able to be a player on the global arena. We don't want to stop this process because that sort of alternative is good because they can eventually 
be their own masters of their own fates, and also be able to show the world that there is an alternative to capitalism that by their own admission has failed everywhere, has failed the United States, has failed to Europe, for all the above reasons, we think that this is the best sort of way for Latin American countries to go. We think that Arkansas should stay home. We beg to oppose. Now, what we say today is that this debate comes to whether the United States of America has a vested interest in intervening and ousting out regimes and preventing regimes of left-winger ideologies and Bolivarianism to, to come to power in Latin America. We believe that from the position of the USA, it would be like extremely harmful and extremely pernicious, and it already is, to leave these people be <coughs> and to leave these politicians run these countries. Also, we do not run away from the burden that these people in the long run will be also better off, but we say that the central burden is to prove the U.S. interest. Now, here's the deal. When it comes to Pinochet and them telling us that people voted against capitalism, we say that that wasn't a referendum against capitalism. It was a referendum against a cruel dictator, against a bloody regime, against a, a, a criminal, and against murders and disappearances and kidnappings. We don't think that that was like a valid point that they made that that means that the people from Latin America are like inherently anti-capitalistic. The reason why they are inherently anti-capitalistic is not because they understand the entire process, but because that that process has been kidnapped by corrupt elites that unfortunately have been brought to power during the 70s, 80s and during the Cold War. Now it's going to be different. And I'm going to explain why is that. Now, another point before I move on to my, uh, to, to, to my substantive is about America having an, an interest to stop intervening worldwide, which like harms its power and harms its influence. We see that this sort of intervention, intervention permeates the least these societies, and it's probably the best way to do so. We don't think that we will, uh, we, we, we will, we don't see Pinochet's arriving uh, uh, to power, in, arising to power in these countries. We don't, we, we, we don't say that we are going to kill off certain political leaders. We don't say we're going to have boots on the ground. We say that this is probably the best way which like the least permeates this society and therefore is the least aggressive one for a change that has to come and has to occur. Now, first point, I'm gonna speak something about Bolivarianism and how the mere fact, which they conceded, that the current left-wing governments are also Bolivarian, most of them are. We think that this sort of Latin American nationalism is something that is like extremely common for the US interests. Reasons for that are twofold. Firstly, we believe that there comes a, it comes a time where Latin American identity now gets defined in opposition to the United States of America. We think that's very pernicious for us because we don't think, no thank you, because we think that US legitimate interests in these countries will be perceived as aggressive and negative per se, which we think is bad because it, it, will, it will mean that we will have like, we will, they will be less prone to accept our interests as legitimate interests. But more importantly, when it comes to this trading block point, we don't want this trading block. We don't think it's good for them, nor it is good for us. We think that NAFTA has done wonders for Mexican people that live uh, nearby United States of America. A lot of people got jobs. A lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people made a lot of money. We don't th think that that's like very bad. But if that's not enough, we think that a similar, similar thing like an inter intercontinental sort of free trade bloc is much, much, much better. In a time when the European Union and the United States of America are negotiating such a thing, in a time where like, a, a lot of countries are negotiating trans-Pacific uh, free trade partnership, we don't need, like, re we don't need like, regional, uh, regional free trade blocs, we need a global one, because that is what keeps people above the poverty line, ladies right. and gentlemen. So we don't think that's like, a valid contribution. Now, secondly, when it comes to this populistic nature of these regimes. Our point was clearly that these people, like the opposition of left-wing governments, the opposition of left-wing parties have like, not only that they don't have a platform, but because of the political culture and because of everything else, they don't stand a chance in these elections. These elections are rigged in advance because we have this sort of uh, populism harming the entire process in several ways. Now, firstly, yes, the memory of the lost decade still exists, but it is skewed by politician, it is being uh, uh, misused as an argument, and therefore people have been brainwashed to believe in that stuff. 
But more, more importantly, we believe that things like subsidies and other things that, that keep a lot of poor people voting for these parties are being used as a, as a tool of political manipulation. Oh, we see a very similar thing going on in Thailand, for example, with the government of, of Taksi Shinavatra's sister. They have, like a, they have a bunch of subsidies and a bunch of poor, poor people will always vote, vote for them because of these subsidies. We think that the exact same thing is happening here. But the most important part is, the, is when Maria says that the opposition doesn't have a platform. Manos is wrong when he says, you know, we had, uh, we had a referenda, which means that the opposition has a platform. No, that doesn't mean that the opposition has a platform. The fact that the two prominent opposition leaders in Venezuela are in jail as we speak, Sp uh, speak to the contrary, ladies and gentlemen. The fact that they cannot get to TV without being addressed to as traitors speak to the contrary, ladies and gentlemen. We believe that this is another reason why this democratic process is skewed over there and while basically we're not harming this sort of democratic bastion over there, but we are uh, correcting something that has been in unjust from the, from the mere beginning. We say that these left-wing governments, because of the Bolivarians and this sort of idea of them being saviors, are more prone to being authoritarian than their alternatives. And here's why. We say that the entire context of them trying to liberate themselves from the West, from the United States influence, creates a certain image of them being like the new Hugo Chavez or whatever, or Evo Morales, or other people who like have this sort of idea that they are messiahs. We think that they, because they think they're infallible, are much more prone to being authoritarian and we want to prevent, we want to prevent that as well because we believe that that harms citizens of these countries also. Now, uh, before I move on to, to, to cronyism and political and business elite and how everything is changed by our policy, go on. So if we buy everything you've said, in order to get elected in Latin America, you have to be populist and this and that the other. Why would your new and start government would be any different in its rhetoric and populism towards its people, especially when it doesn't have to put in the extra money to convince them because it doesn't have them on the side? Okay, brilliantly. That's like the last part of my speech. Now, when it comes to political and business elites that we are referring to in this case, we are talking about people who unfortunately came there when we started the shock doctrine. There. We think that was like extremely wrong way to do so. We're going to do it right this time. We're not going to do it by using and utilizing the same people that have this sort of uh, uh, they had this sort of communication with the government. And more importantly, this man doctrine that we used to implement is changed now. During the Cold War, we, we had to accept dictators. Not anymore, ladies and gentlemen. We had to because we had to fight another, another enemy which is like much, much bigger. Now, in these days, ladies and gentlemen, we will not tolerate such a thing because it will harm us in the long run. We do not want dictators there. We do not want cronism there. And that is why we're going to fight. Now, how is this going to be different? Where we are going to bust apart this sort of linkage and we are going to introduce new subjects, new economic subjects who will be able to spread, to spread their own, their own uh, businesses and therefore employ new people. A completely different set of people who will not become a new, uh, a new elite because the, the new one is the one that we in a way control and, the, and, and that in a way we have a vested interest of maintaining as democratic as possible. For all these reasons, we beg you to vote for this. Mr. Speaker, we want uh, to emphasize a couple of, couple of things in our speech, in our deliberation. Firstly, we think that we will, we will try to show you that finding out that manipulation was involved is inevitable, and we will see what bad repercussions come from when people find out what it happened. Secondly, we want to see why the previ when we previously tried this, why did it fail, and why the same scenario is simply bound to be happening again. Thirdly, we want to talk about what happens and about what's, how problematic it is when the change that we want for a certain system to, to, uh, to, to undergo, how problematic it is when this change comes from the other sources rather than from the organic change that would come within. And finally, we want to talk about why is it crucially important, especially for this region, for that change to come within and why is that beneficial. But before that, a couple of points of rebuttal. Now, firstly, what we had from the opening government is that currently this 
these systems are actually limiting the freedom of choices uh, of these of the individuals on the grounds living under this system. But they don't show us how this is not actually the same thing coming from them. Because we see that the, by this manipulation, we are actually also distorting this freedom of choices of the same people. We don't see why they are better than the current system. They have that burden. Secondly, they say that government control level, no, thank you, are now high and problematic in this level. But this doesn't seem that if you shift the government control of their entity to the other governments as well as uh, to the, for example, of the control of the US, why is that better and beneficial as well? Secondly, the problematic thing about that is that the US as a government currently is controlling their own citizens. We see acknowledgement of tapping the phones and similar. So liberties, as Manos were, exp were explaining, are quite limited in the US as well. No, thank you. But more, most importantly here on the rebuttal side, it's kind of, now, Redundant to say from the country that is pretty much leftist now that the systems in Latin America who are leftists are somehow bad but should adopt something of the values where, which even US now doesn't recognize. We are talking about the government that also nationalized banks now, nationalized uh, car industries, gave a lot of money to the people in problem. Well, we have Obamacare, perfect. We agree <laughs> that these values are good. Now it seems kind of funny to say that this, if this, somebody else does these values and this is not for a benefit of you and he's in, in your neighborhood country, you should actually impose different values for them that even you adopt. Better aging for you in this scenario would be Russia in, like, <laughs> implementing than the US. No, quite problematic. No, thank you. And when they talk about NAFTA agreement in this scenario, we see that that doesn't work as well because of the government control of the US. Because you have cities on Arizona border with Mexico which are two same cities who are dealing in a cooperation that we in what you have, in one you have prosperity and it's on the US side and the other one's not getting any of the benefits of these agreements that are made by the government. But let's see, no thank you, let's see a couple of issues of our constructors. Firstly, why do people er er find out? Inevitably, people like to talk and on the grounds know what it happened. They generally know uh, what it happens. But you also have the scenarios do you suddenly get the information like, I don't know, Che Guevara being killed by, then by the man who was paid by the US, and the sense. And people find out that stuff. That's kind of problematic. Simply, you cannot hide it the, that much. And what you achieve then, no thank you, is that simply people on the ground become more resistant to any change, that even if it's good change, because they start doubting the system. And they, this is problematic. Especially, it's problematic if you find out that it's done by your neighbor with whom you, you should be cooperating and similar. We simply say that. Some such thing uh, even slows down the process of reconciliations of these people in the region. Furthermore, secondly, we want to talk why the previous systems fail. We see that the systems were failing because firstly, they were oppressive. All of the values apparently upon which they were holding their grounds were maybe considered as I mean, perceived by us actually uh, to being something good. Secondly, to have effective rule of law, people need to consent to that rule of law. And we see that when you impose these people not giving the consent makes this function, system functioning not simply being able. No, thank you later on. Even if they would do something good, for example, if we consider that the open market might be having some benefits, you know, that's uh, people become resistant to such change all be, to the extent that it makes uh, that open market not function even for the benefits of themselves, if nothing else to make that confirmation bias on the sense that the government that was implemented was evil in the, because it wasn't coming from them. No, thank you. Finally, we want to talk about what happens when you impose the government on someone or when you bring the change to someone who is... Um, uh, before I go to that, uh, yeah, Stefan. Uh, considering that Chile did depose Pinochet but kept free market reforms like a privatized retirement system, what counterexample can you provide? Yeah, Serbia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, in that sense, when we come to the changes, when how do you adapt to the change? Why is it better when it's not come? If it comes from from the outside, and we'll, we will see some examples of that. If the change is imposed, first the people doubt in that change, but you also give the people the ability then. Firstly, they less trust the, the system because it was imposed to them. But secondly, you remove the accountability of the people, which we think it's very important. Because they say, if the system fails, they always then say, ah, the system failed because it wasn't brought by us, it was brought by somebody else. And then they are less, they are less prone to actually make the system work, which we think is also problematic. Uh, they will blame the failures of the system on somebody else. A good example of this is, for example, Iraq, where you have imposed a system on them and not bring the organic change when the people are actually trying, you're, we are maintaining now the system with arms on the grounds and similar, and we are apparently uh, claiming that it's working whether it's not and people are resistant to it, but 
Furthermore, we have other examples when change is coming from, from within. The people have the interest actually to work. Firstly, they trust the system more. Secondly, they, uh, they don't have this uh, uh, ability to remove the responsibility for them on not working, or on the, uh, of why the system is not working. But we think that good example of that is Serbia, for example, where we had, when Milosevic is in power, what, what it made all the values of, from the West that were had were trying to be imposed on us. In that sense, Milosevic was easily, for Milosevic he had a good leverage in a, to, to claim to the people that this is something evil because it's coming from abroad and, they, they, and to create they versus us policy. While when we, ad, and the people were generally uh, against these values, but the change of the perception of people towards these values came not because somebody posed on us, but because we elected the government for which firstly didn't uh, approve the, these values and similar, but generally had to start factoring in if they wanted to stay in power, they started factoring in the value of the EU and similar. So that changed the idea of people inside of them whether they would believe in the EU values and similar. So Serbia now has like 75% of people actually really uh, striving towards EU values and being part of EU. Not because somebody posed the change on us. Although just 10 or 20, 15 years ago, the, such, you didn't have such a crucial mass. So, crucial mass came when people had catered the change within or organically. Because all of these reasons, please vote up. Surprisingly, we're very proud to propose the motion. <laughs> now, looking at the last Serbian elections, I think I can easily claim that democratic electorates don't always make the decisions which are in their own best interest. And that's broadly what we're standing on as closing government. Four points. Why is this inherent? Why is this legitimate? Why is this good for United States interests? Why is this good for those, own, for those countries? And forty, how this generally doesn't harm our reputation in any meaningful way. Before that, one point of reputation, most of it will be interwoven. Okay, so Chira tells us that, that broadly when people see, see some reforms fail, they will blame others. Now here's the deal. If we're rigging elections, we can suppose that we probably won't let people know about it. So, so they won't be aware that the guys that actually came to power, by the way, of the CIA, weren't actually elected by them. So they will have the feeling that actually those people were there in the first place. But even if you don't like that, even when we do elect our own governments in South America, and actually those people make very stupid and very rational decisions, like Hugo Chavez or Nicolas Maduro, they always blame the United States for everything that goes wrong. They always blame for the United States for the fact that they're incompetent to run a country because they're basically just poisoning everything with radical de uh, demagogy and left-wing rhetoric. So we don't think that that point stands. Okay, our extension. Why is this legitimate? Firstly, we don't think that the United States necessarily has a mandate to uphold democracy everywhere, nor that they should do that. We tell you that democracy doesn't have intrinsic value. It is only valuable to the extent that it can achieve certain outcomes. We tell you that often, up to a certain level of uh, economic development, a dictatorship, an autocratic country, is far more functional in actually bringing well-being to its citizens. Now, we tell you that like, having the ability to elect someone is less important than having a good life, being able to have quality food, being able not to have 300% inflation in a year because you have an idiotic government. Number two, we tell you that the most of the obligations that the United States has are towards its own citizens and, and actually increasing their own economic benefit. We tell you that this is broadly because the United States has unique power over its own citizens. It can't make well, usually it can. It can make Argentinian people go to war. It can make the U.S. people go to war. Now, here's the difference. Why is this good for the United States? Firstly, we tell you that the fact that you have someone who's propped up by you means that you have a unique influence over those regimes. That's why we were able to send the Chicago boys to Chile, because basically Pinochet was dependent on the United States. 
when you have an, a democratic, an undemocratic regime, which was basically propped up by you, you have a unique influence over them. Why is this good? Second, this is the second reason. Broadly, because of the U.S. interests, they can implement drastic free market reforms. Now, generally, countries which are the, the most dominant economically are the ones which have a big, the biggest vested interest in a free market. That's why throughout history, the countries which propagated liberal capitalism were always the ones which was the most powerful one. That was Britain in the 19th century. That's the U.S. in the 20th and 21st century. What does this mean? Once they do open their markets, you can get, you can get their resources, you can get your own products in. So this is in the interest of the United States. Thirdly, we tell you that by spreading free markets, you're broadly spreading the United States system of values, like the idea that individuals have their own autonomy and can make their own individual choices. And lastly, we tell you, no thank you, that it, this actually leads to the stability of those regimes. This leads to those people making decisions which will actually make their country stable in the long term. True, they will probably, some of them did lock up people in stadiums and kill them, I don't know who, but yeah, but the idea is that it, ena it enables them to have a stable regime. And the comparative with that is Hugo Chavez doing pretty much the same things in Venezuela, so we don't see how Manos wins on that point. Okay, why is this good for those countries? This is very important. No, thank you. Okay, one, we tell you that there is often a large degree of populism in those countries when you have left-wing governments in the first place. Why? Because often you don't have a stable democratic culture. If you look at South America in the last two centuries, most of their political systems are basically a copy-paste of the U.S. political system. Now, the problem with that is if you don't have a rich country, it often leads to presidential systems which are semi-autocratic. That means that a lot of countries in South America have histories of military dictatorships, of non-democracy. There is not a stable democratic electorate which rationally assesses arguments, but rather than that, people who are attracted to strong leaders. That's why you have basically a strong presidential system run by people who sound populistic in South America. But what's the problem with that? We tell you that these people often make decisions which are not in the best interest of their countries. They often try to, pro like look at Venezuela. It's probably one of the oil richest countries in the world, but because you have an incompetent government, no thank you, they're, they're unable to have a stable economy. We tell you that this changes. Why? Firstly, when you have a free market, it leads to an increase in capital in that country. That happened in Chile. True, you have an increase in growth inequality, but what we tell you is that at the moment, when those countries reach a certain extent of development, that's when you can have meaningful, meaningful redistribution of wealth. What we tell you is that in order to have a good welfare state, you need a large amount of capital to actually spread it across the people in the first place. If you try to have left-wing policies from the start, that is unable to happen. Go. 1% of US citizens, most richest citizens, own 80% of US wealth. This you have already discovered. Okay, one, that's not true. It's closer to 30%. But even if it is, the point is that there is a lot of money for people who are lower there. We tell you the true, like it's the Margaret Thatcher argument. It's better to have this than this. Okay. okay. Secondly, we tell you, however, that even after these countries get rid of those non-elected, basically dictatorial governments, they still keep those free market reforms which are actually beneficial for them. So look at Chile. Even though they did oppose Pinochet, they, they, kept, they kept a private retirement fund system. This leads to Chile, no thank you, even with its inequality, being the richest country of South America, having the most stable economy of South America. In comparison with countries like Argentina, which is going which basically has a bankruptcy every single decade because you have populist governments which don't enact uh, policies which are used for in the long term. Rather something that says, oh look, we stick it up, we stick it up to the US. That doesn't help those countries as much as you feel good about yourself. Lastly, why doesn't this harm us? as the United States. Like, the US already does, does a lot of very bad things and truly has harmed their reputation to a certain extent, but they're still st seen as a bastion of democracy in the world, mostly. So things like Guantanamo, the prison program, the invasion of Iraq, the deposition of various people has influenced US reputation to a certain extent, but the US has managed to keep its reputation as the most prosperous and like most liberal country in the world. Moreover, with regards to the identity in South, in South America, we tell you that this is often based on the United States. The United States has been active there in defending the region for the last 200 years. If you look at the Monroe Doctrine, which basically made those countries part of the U.S. influence sphere, so that doesn't change drastically. Okay, Mr. Speaker, because the U.S. has a mandate to do this, because it is good for their own citizens, and most importantly, because it's good for people in those countries, vote Pinochet. Yes.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first of all, we would like to take a look on several things that, that the government has so far given us, and then we will explain to you why free elections are important, why they're important in South America. Uh, what is the situation in post-election societies, especially when you, rig this, when you rig the elections, what the government is proposing at the moment? We will give you an alter alternative that actually exists already in South America, about which they have not spoken. So when they talked about economic policies that we have uh, today in, in, in South, South, Amer South America, we believe that the first uh, position already explained that all that nationalism and cronism about which they spoke, we have a factical uh, national, nationalization of uh, GM and then fallen banks and we believe that that has been taken off, off of the table. Now the goals that the first government has put upon us which they would like to achieve by rigging the elections in South, in South American countries in which the left wing governments are about, uh, would, are about to win on, on the elections. Now they talk about st stability and the prosperity of those systems. We will explain that through our argument on, on situation in post, in post election societies. Also, they mentioned, especially the second, the second uh, government, that the laissez-faire, and the first government, the laissez-faire is something to what we should strive and to what the South American countries should strive. We believe that if the government believes in laissez-faire, if they believe in the free markets, we don't understand why they're against free elections. The elections are the, the prototype of markets where you have one ballot, you throw in that ballot, and you have a vote, and then you you vote like you would vote on the free market by choosing a product you would like to buy. Now that is a market of votes. Uh, votes. We do not see why they would oppose a very liberal market of votes that, that we would have that we have in democracies. Uh, also, they spoke about geopolitical uh, uh, positions and why it is important for the United States of America, from the geolo geopolitical perspective, to have uh, to influence on on the elections covertly. <laughs> In, in South America. Now, we do not see and we did not hear from the, from the government, from either first or the second, what actual threat do we have for the United States of America from the left-wing countries in South America? We, have, we had Chavez and we now we have Maduro. Both were barking dogs, both did, were not able to mobilize or the South America, all, although they tried all, all along, or other oh, countries during the world during the world to, to, to increase anything, any, any uh, uh, combat against the United States of America. And we have the example of Cuba, probably the longest existing country with, with the leader that was uh, longest on power uh, and backed at the moment from, from, the United, from the Union of Soviet States, which did not, we, who did not manage to do anything. Actually, they were uh, isolated on their island, although there was a chance that they will get nuclear missiles. They got isolated on their island, and now after uh, 50 years, we have a position where then they are opening up because they have realized what problems the social policies yeah. that they have, they have taken up uh, are bringing about. We also did not understand how will this actually, by rigging the, the elections in those countries, how will, will this bring about prosperity for those countries in which we are providing elections? I mean, will people's minds suddenly get changed by, by the rigged elections and then they will accept policies which they would not accept uh, uh, on another, another basis? Now, why is it important to have free elections, why is it important to accept and support the will of the majority of people, which is the point of, of, of democracy? Now, we believe that ideas that are accepted on the free elections that we propose should, should happen in, in South America represent the legitimate ideas that exist in a society, um, an aggregate of those ideas. And we believe that the left ideas which promote egalitarianity, solidarity and distribution, we do not see why they are a problem with, with, with the government. Now, when you have elections in, in, in a country and when you have uh, rigged elections. We would like to see so what happens in those societies after after the elections. Legitimacy is an important factor for the acceptance of the ruling regime. And if you have a great majority, as is the case in those countries in which the United States already ceded a, a left wing party will win, will get will get to power. We do not see how that majority will accept the policies that the uh, rigged uh, government that would come from the United States of America. How will they accept those policies as legitimate? Why they wouldn't? How, how does the government not see that we will have riots and that we will have conflicts because of those policies? This is especially why covertness and secrecy is a very bad idea. And even if people don't know what happened, for at least a, a, a short period of time, but we don't see how that will uh, uh, proceed for, for a longer period of time, we believe that eventually this will lead to probably riots and conflict that will not involve a small number of people who will stand up and say, okay, we want leftist policies, policies we want to fight against. That, no, you have that majority who already voted for left policies now rising up against the policies in which they uh, were against uh, at the first place. Now, there are two ways 
you get riots in a country. First of all, you can have a riot, you can have a riot in a country where you have an uh, illegitimate government, where you have, uh, where the United States of America would impose a rightist government, the leftists that were leftists and who were in the majority, they will remain leftists. They won't change their opinions because you propose some other policies. On that point. No, they will stay, they will remain with that with those policies and th with their stances, uh, leftist stances. They will take down that government, and that will also bring empowerment to the leftists that are fighting against when they see that a large number of people are rising up up against that government. On the other side, if you have a legitimate government and you have governments that whose results create trouble for their people, you will have a great probability that those people will see that those policies aren't working. And that is the case in Venezuela. Over time, we have evolution of, uh, of resistance against those leftist, leftist ideas. And we have seen that, especially since Chavez uh, passed away and Maduro came to power, especially with, with the farce, with their toilet paper things. They have seen that those policies which they uh, uh, proposed did not work. Now, what is the alternative that we would like to, to, to propose here, and which we would like to explain? At the moment, you have, uh, um, which we believe that the government should, should, should accept, uh, at the moment you have in South America uh, a leader who is also a barking uh, leftist, who is going around talking how globalism is a bad thing and all of that, but he's actually increasing wealth and he has pretty liberal policies in many of the economic sectors. And here we're talking about uh, Morales, about, about his country. We believe that that is a great example where you have a leftist who came to power but is actually going, doing good things for his people and not bad things as, as the government has, has uh, opposed on, on, other, on other examples. So we believe that we have shown you the importance of the free elections. We believe that we have shown you what situation, what problems rigging of elections will bring about in, this, in these societies. We believe that there is a very, very uh, serious alternative to, to rigging elections in, in South American countries. Thank you. How fitting that this is red. Push <laughs> uh, <laughs> They say that left-wing puppet regimes are bad, that right-wing puppet regimes are bad, right? We see no clear distinction here how lefties in uh, Latin America did anything beneficial for their people other than acquisition of social peace through borrowed funds that wasn't theirs with money that doesn't exist for them only to, to prolong the, the amount of time that they can govern and that they can remain in power. We're going to sum up this debate in three very clear clashes, politics, economy, and somewhat of a social thing that came up by opening up. But before that, three broad things we have to tell on the extension, uh, on the extension of closing up. Firstly, they propose this idea that elections are prototypes of markets and you have a free market of votes. Well, like in any market, the state has a mandate to regulate any state that, that has power, that can enact power, has a mandate to regulate, like with taxes and subsidies, if outcomes aren't most beneficial. A free market ideal doesn't really exist, you need to have some sort of irregulated capitalism. Secondly, they tell us that how will, how will this... Uh, yeah, how will this provide any, any beneficial things? Because these policies weren't voted in, uh, people who enact these policies, policies weren't voted in by these people. Firstly, we tell you that generally the motion implies that it's going to be covert so people won't know. Secondly, even if it does break out, we believe that it will mostly remain on the level of conspiracy theorists like Ancient Aliens or History Channel and stuff like that. And thirdly, we tell you that the, the tacit authority that governments possess is mostly, mostly gripping in, this, in these countries because these people are on the fringes of their own societies. These people have no money to persevere. These people have no food, water, shelter, and whatnot. We're going to have a bloody civil war in Venezuela, and, but we're going, we still have a minister of supreme happiness. They seriously have that thing. They have an electorate called the Minister of Supreme Happiness, which voted in the, the, the bill pa uh, claiming that the prices of the electronics need to be cut down by 20% because the decadent capitalistic propaganda from the North America is ruining their system. 
Three months later, civil war. Now, what we, what we have to tell you here, basically we're going to go through our, ex through our extension speech and go clash by clash. So firstly, what do we have in these countries in terms of politics? We have populistic, corruptive governments. We have people inducing fear into hearts of their voters in order to galvanize their cries for help in order to remain in power even more. Because only by remaining in power, they can differentiate from, the, from those people and live any better. We believe that's a very selfish notion. We believe that's how certain countries some of them even in Europe, have, have come to, to ask for handouts from other countries in order to survive. They use political, not economic efficiency. No, thank you. They use what, uh, what produces voting, voting body sufficient social peace through their acquisition of the same in order to galvanize their votes so that they can remain in power. This leads to further destabilization. The best, uh, the best example for this actually I think is Spain that avowed by, by their bailout agreement to put down their GDP debt uh, to around 6.2%. One year later it's 108 when they asked them what the hell happened. Sorry dude. So basically they have no, no mechanisms of control. We on side of government have because we are the dominant superpower. And basically this is where the, every, every single argument of theirs against trickle down doesn't really work. No thank you. Because unlike other states around the world, the United States of America actually have a minimum wage of $8 per hour. What's the minimum wage in Greece? I don't know. What's the 13, what's the 13 paycheck in Greece? I don't know. No thank you. You had your 13 paychecks, far enough. Now, basically, what, what's happening here is the fact, much love, is the fact, <laughs> is, no, thank you, is the fact that people fail to see uh, any efforts of any given platform, of any given opposition, because the opposition is demonized solely in the fact it's a Western thing. Right, so basically we're evening out the scales by giving people the option to live under for a certain period of time under policies which are free market. Yeah, and I, I like that term actually, free market. So basically, why is this legitimate for us? It's legitimate for us because it produces the best outcome. Democra democracy, like stated by our extension, has no intrinsic value under, other than producing best outcomes. It has a premise of producing best outcomes by galvanizing people's efforts, but here people are blindsided by the fact, no thank you Manos, that they were living under, well, Chavez, Pinochet and people like that. So secondly, we believe that this is mostly beneficial for the United States. Firstly, on the fact that, well, it, yeah, it kind of outspreads our values in order to make it far easier for us to market our own, our own goods in order to, to, well, to achieve some sort of economic betterment, but mostly for these people because firstly, they receive cheaper products, secondly, they receive better products, and thirdly, they can, they can specialize into other things other than asking for handouts. Now, what we believe here is the fact that it's also good, beneficial for these people because in the long run it produces some sort of stability. This sort of semi-autocracy uh, that we have right now is being propped up by military dictatorships which are relics of the Cold War. Mr. Speaker, the Cold War is over. The narratives following, yes, and narratives, following, that following the Cold War are over. We no longer have these big blocks of capitalism, communism. We have the new force of, well, evil, socialism. And, uh, and no, even, even though Obama may be a little bit crimson right now, we don't think he's hardcore so, so socialistic, right? Now, what we believe here... Uh, yeah, I can understand. Go. Yeah, like all the sheep labor competitive relations that will assume that the United States of America, if they intervene, much like the EU and Greece, would have to keep prices at a lower level, try to keep people just above the poverty line so that everything can be cheaper. Is it in the US interest to piss people off by making sure that the continent closer to it, instead of becoming a very prosperous trade block, you could sell products, so it becomes just a sweatshop for them? No, we believe that outsourcing will not hit Latin America anytime soon. Moreover than that, we believe that it is in the United States' inherent interest to have good trading routes with the southern neighbors, if anything, then for oil that is these uh, impoverished people don't really know how to use better. The, the, take the, the example of Venezuela, for, 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 for example. Now, what we tell you here is that these people cannot further specialize into, for instance, extracting oil because they have political unrest, political unrest ensuing all other social unrest that can occur in their power. Now, back on the way. Sometimes strong leaders are necessary and sometimes strong policies are necessary even if people don't realize it and perceive the direct benefits of these policies because at the time these people are given a chance to vote these policies in, they do not have a clear picture of it. They have dispute populistic rhetoric used by lefty, lefty parties by telling you that the West, well in their case the North, <coughs> is robbing you, that they're selling you ca uh, capitalism and consumerism and that it's bad for your MK. Now what we're telling you here is that people either A, need to receive some sort of a neutral value norm cost benefit analysis which they cannot receive right now because they're effectively being lied to and it, 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 that further skews the democratic process. We tell you that even if, if this doesn't graph on it, it will be mostly beneficial for these nations to experience some sort of a free market, some sort of a liberalized notion of free trade in order to see how it goes.
right? So basically, what does this, what does this come down to? Firstly, yes, we do have the mandate as the United States. Secondly, even though it is legit, we see that it's mostly beneficial, firstly for us, because we don't have some allies of similar right-wing notion uh, like we are, the Chicago boys. Secondly, we see that it is mostly beneficial for people of these countries. And lastly, but not leastly, we see no direct harm for our side of the house. For all of these reasons, Mr. Speaker, I'm more than proud to propose this motion. that people in Central and South America are idiots. Well, let's see two possibilities. If they are, they are obviously uh, aware of the situation that's going on in the country, and if they decide not to fight it, they deserve to live in the conditions they currently, they're currently living in. Well, if you're really silly enough to allow that, it's your problem, nobody is uh, responsible of helping you. On the other hand, if they are not, they will figure out the way to fight and to, to fight for their rights. So what happens? Um, um, at least last, I don't know, for last year, uh, the number of people who died in Venezuela in one weekend was uh, equal to the number of people who died in Syria in one week. Why? Because, well, what is the first thing, no, thank you, what is the first thing you do when you have money? You buy a bulletproof car because of the, uh, of the really bad situation among people that is going on currently. So we believe that if people are really silly enough to accept that for a longer time period, let it be. So. Uh, yes, the side of the government has been saying that uh, this is that these um, measures, that, like faking the results of the um, elections, are there to help people develop, to help their freedom, la la la. Well, it is highly unlikely to happen. Why? First of all, uh, U U.S. wants them to develop to a certain extent. U.S. will never let them develop their full potential. Why? Because U.S. is not a really big fan of competition, first of all. No, thank you. Um, not a big fan of competition following that. It, it will always be limiting the development of those countries if uh, they help them um, to go over the... the the first point of like changing the government. So uh, they keep saying that, yeah, there's no way we're gonna, no, thank you. We're gonna cover up the elections. We're gonna make it su super, super, super um, secret and nobody will never know about it. Well, what if it happens that, what if the government that has been imposed by the US fails? What if it's like the same really bad thing that's going on? And what if the people find out? Then you have another couple of decades people really hating and rioting about the US and this is counterproductive to everything that side of no thank you has been saying. <laughs> okay, <coughs> then. A liberation of nations from the government control. Well, that, yeah, this is the point that the side of government has been making. Uh, yes, please. Mike. The reason why people are rioting is because poverty and corruption that is 50 years long. These are the elites that are part of the liberal uh, uh, right, uh, left-wing parties, and these are the people that we want to put out uh, of, the, of the places they are there. We will talk about poverty and those things in a second. But let me just um, let me just continue uh, with the yeah. Okay, so uh, you want to liberate the nations from the governments and everything from like the bad governments. So we have two types of governments. First of all, you need to understand that people need to be led by someone. People have to have somebody in front of them. They, if, well, as Dostoevsky said, if you give them freedom, they will take, they will carry it for a while, they will come back and put it down on you, at your feet, begging you to take them back because people are not capable. Freedom is too big of a burden for people to take. So. We have two possibilities. One, people led, being led by the government, no thank you, they chose themselves, or two, people being led by the government that was imposed to them. Both possibilities, obviously, people are, be, people are being led. So the side of the opposition has constantly been explaining to you why it is better for people, if they are going to fail, if it's possible for them to fail, to be failing, led by the government that they chose themselves rather than by something that was already imposed to them. Okay, so, uh, there is uh, the pro the side of government has been uh, showing as a problem of the mindset of the people that U.S. just wants to conquer them, etc., etc. 
Well, US has been proven through a couple of decades that it's a kind of a selfish country. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, and as a selfish country, I think, well, we believe that those kind of, no, thank you, have a reasonable basis to believe that US does not want to make them the center of the universe rather than to exploit them. And how is that parallel to what has been going on before? Well, basically, as we all know, no, thank you, Maria, those countries are really rich in resources, oil and uh, gas and like whatever. So uh, if by creating, no, thank you, by creating a free market, what are you doing? You're doing the same things Europeans have been doing to Indians. You're bringing well, pearls, you're bringing like uh, jewelry with all the colors and everything. You're selling it to them. You're taking away their gold. U.S. is going to be stamping money, uh, having free market for the well, use, let's say, products, taking away gold, taking away oil, which is basically the biggest basis of their On free market. Yeah. No, thank you. So, the side of the government has been arguing that yes, the system that no, oh, no, thank you, and no, thank you. The system that the, uh, in the US, that is currently um, in the US is like the best one for everybody and we should all have that kind of system. Well, how about no, why? Because one of the basic things of the, well, system in the country is the healthcare system. And what happens in the health, in the current healthcare system in the United States, you have um, the, how do you say that? Uh, uh, dude, no. Okay, so you have the companies, yeah, the, co the insuring companies, the healthcare insuring companies. And uh, if you're not able to pay for your, if your company is not willing to pay uh, for your treatment and if you're not able to pay, you know what happens? They take you from your bed, you, they put you in a cab, no thank you, they throw you away in front of a refugee camp, uh, in front of the like place for the homeless people, no thank you. Yes, why it is relevant? Because if you're trying to impose a certain measure, you need to impose a, uh, if you're trying to organize a country differently and if you're setting yourself as a no thank you, perfect example of a country that is uh, no thank you, that other countries should look up to, better fix your own things first and then try lecturing others on how to lead a country for crying out loud. Okay, yeah, so we I believe that we have explained to you on the basis of the free market how uh, it is usually that... No, it's... Uh, thanks, thanks, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, on the, uh, yeah, the basis of the free market, how it's usually that money goes from the poor to the rich countries and allowing this motion to pass would be just another chance given to the US to take the money from the poor countries and take it to itself because that's how the system works because if they could they would do it. So we believe that the things like what are the people stupid enough to do that? Are the people self-destructive? Well, we believe not. We just say that they need some time, that they need some better organization to figure it out themselves uh, in order to fight the current system and if they're really silly enough, let it be. So, uh, the points that we believe that we have proven to you here is that the US, first of all, has no right to destroy democracy for something like that, for like, uh, something like this to uh, endanger democratic uh, will of the people that has been shown in the elections and for all this given explained things we are proud to approve.